Hello, and welcome to the final day of the VIF Immersed Volumetric Market. So glad to have you. Today, you're going to be hearing from eight projects who have completed masterful works uh, that uh, were built on top of volumetric and used volumetric capture uh, as a cornerstone of their projects. These works are completed. They're done. Uh, they are just looking for distribution, uh, exhibition opportunities, curation at festivals, uh, and help in that arena. So you're in for a treat because these are highly polished and beautiful works, and you get to hear directly from the geniuses who made them. Uh, and in case you didn't know, this volumetric market is an opportunity to bring together artists and studios and industry folk uh, to explore uh, how we can make volumetric filmmaking uh, a meaningful part of the media landscape. Because we at Kaleidoscope and at VIF believe uh, deeply in volumetric filmmaking as a uh, important art form and something that will play a larger role uh, in the media landscape of the future. Um, so uh, there's a couple other talks uh, after this, and we uh, hope to see you in the Museum of Other Realities to experience these projects, as well as just hang out and talk to the artists and one another. Uh, I'm going to thank some people now. Uh, I'm gonna thank the province of British Columbia, uh, one of our biggest supporters, the Western Economic Diversification Fund, the Canadian Media Producers Association, the Canada, or Canada Media Fund, uh, and Valerie uh, Creighton, who's the CEO of the CMF, uh, Microsoft Mixed Reality Capture Studios, Tata V, Sense of Space, and EFEV. Uh, of course, I uh, have to also thank uh, the Museum of Other Realities and the amazing team there that really hustled uh, without too much time or resources to pull off a really top-notch exhibition. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, also thank my amazing event producer, Anna Brzezinska, who uh, uh, none of this would be possible without. So thank you so much, Anna. Uh, all right, let's get started. Uh, first up uh, is going to be the Holy City. Uh, Nimrod, Sean, are you there? Good to see you, friend. Uh, I believe you are muted, or I have my ears muted. Um, I was. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. Well, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen and jumping into the presentation, uh, we can just get right uh, to it. Is this working well? It's working well. Okay, thank you. So welcome to the Holy City. My name is Nimrod Chanit, and I created this project together with Timur Musabe and Sean Evans, who will be taking part in the QA at the end of this presentation. Uh, sorry. Uh, the Holy City is an immersive extended reality experience and a multifaceted platform that transports participants to Jerusalem and provides access to the most sacred rituals and the holiest sites of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Jerusalem, the holy city, carries a rich history, an undeniable mm -hmm. spirituality, and an indescribable magnetism that can now be experienced in a virtual format. The experience takes place in a photoreal volumetric captures of some of the most significant and beautiful sites in Jerusalem, highlighting its architectural beauty diverse inhabitants, and spiritual history. This experience exists to cultivate understanding by exploring our fundamental similarities. The experience uses gamification and interactivity for the purpose of documentary storytelling, guiding the viewer through a maze of stories and sites. For the first time, the holiest sites of Jerusalem have been captured using photogrammetry, lighter scanning, and volumetric filming. Here's an example. Thank you. 
Visitors work together to complete tasks as they travel through volumetric captures, unlocking clues and completing challenges. Teamwork and collaboration unlock rewarding Stereo 360 videos of the holiest day at each of the holiest sites, making rare moments previously inaccessible to most of the world accessible virtually. The challenges illuminate common values between the three Abrahamic religions which hold Jerusalem sacred. The Holy City offers a number of activation formats to provide groups of participants an unforgettable experience. Our extended reality installation is on permanent display at the Tower of David Museum in Jerusalem. Customized to the space, this activation is built for groups. One participant, one participant enters the experience in a VR headset. Other participants in the group monitor the progress of the VR user on a large screen and play along using a parallel augmented reality experience, working together to solve the challenges as a team. Um, we are currently in the process of producing guided tour in VR of the Holy Site and uh, the Holy my City name for is Father Samuel Arroyo. I'm the superior of the Holy Sepulchre Church of the Armenian Patriarch of Jerusalem. The experience uses um, and utilizes standalone mobile headsets and allows multiple users to socialize as avatars and interact with the guide. Indeed, Jerusalem could serve as a model for mankind, a city not claimed by anyone that belongs to everybody. The Holy City um, has a, um, a sequel called the Holy, C Holy City Exodus. Uh, which we're just beginning uh, to produce. This leverages the success and knowledge acquired to produce a new experience, taking users on a virtual pilgrimage to Turkey and Israel, connecting these ancient locations through space and time via virtual, pla virtual portals using and utilizing the XR2 um, embedded headsets. Uh, we were supported generously by Canadian and Israeli funds, um, and we've been traveling to a new, numerous fest film festivals worldwide, um, and we seek to expand our reach to all corners of the world. We are an interfaith team of Jewish, uh, Christian, and Muslim filmmakers working together to bring this unique perspective. And it's a great pleasure to be working as a team and present our solution. Uh, thank you, Kaleidoscope and VIF, uh, to allow us to present and be would hope that we can find um, more places and more people we could share this experience with. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nimrod. And hello, Sean. Thank you. Uh, decision makers, turn your, your videos on and jump in and ask questions. Come on, big brains. I have a simple question. Hey, Lauren. I that was um, compelled by hearing the, these sort of like par parallel experiences. One sounds like it's virtual reality, one's augmented reality. Um, can you elaborate on that? Like, what that like from a first person perspective? What's that actually like for both of those roles? So we have a number of formats. The um, if you like the extended reality version or the multi-user uh, reality version is. Uh, a place. It's a it's a unique room which we designed, and it has. Um, um, a tablet, like a Microsoft Surface tablet. And um, using that tablet, we connected using a client server, the, the tablet to the VR experience. So um, you can only progress with the VR experience only if the, um, the people in AR have um, acquired or um, succeeded in their own role in, in the game. So they're playing on the AR tablet, they're using it to run uh, various challenges and only after or while the vr user is kind of running through the experience and exploring the site which they can see on the big screen they're kind of playing their own role and they have this kind of bracelet um, that they have on their hand and every time one of them succeeds this opens a portal or creates an opportunity for the experience to continue so they kind of depend on one another um, to succeed and complete the, the journey I'll just jump in that like one of the observations we had originally envisioned this sort of as a, a single user experience and you know it quickly became apparent that you know 
the, the groups of people that were visiting museums uh, were arriving, it's not just one person. So it would be a scenario where in a traditional VR exhibit, you'd have like one person in VR and four family members watching them experience a VR thing. Uh, where, you know, it, it became sort of obvious that we needed to find some way of kind of engaging the other people that were in the space and having them have it, have sort of agency and an active part in the, um, the experience. Great. Other uh, questions, other feedback? Does, um, it sounds like uh, the AR users are, you know, sort of supporting the VR user through their journey. Is there like two way? Sort of communication and interaction between those pieces? Precisely, yeah, there is. Um, they depend on one another. Um, again, this is just one iteration. The, we've kind of explored various options. So this is one installation that exists in a museum, in a particular museum. Um, we are at the moment um, in development of a multi-user, 15 users um, going through a guided tour of the city. So that's another version. We have um, a web series of seven videos that are 360 stereo videos um, that are, you know, opening up to uh, telecom companies and exploring, you know, the 360 kind of um, space, if you like. Um, but uniquely, I mean, the, the experience we initially designed is a standalone, uh, sorry, a single user kind of experience, and which is one hour long. Um, so it takes you one hour to explore every aspect and every um, kind of site in the Holy City. Um, so that is uh, another version. And finally, we have a shorter version, which is meant for festivals, which is just 25 minutes long. Um, and it just just uh, abbreviated kind of version of the same project. Uh, so it can be played in for festivals in, in a shorter time lapse. Can I ask a question, Nimrod? The, the one hour version and the um... The 25 minute single user version are though do those both also have the elements of gamification in them yeah that yeah of course they're both um gamified um experiences the one hour is we kind of had um various festivals approach us and we said instead of having one uh one hour long experience you can actually split it into four rooms so each room kind of um in some way you know the jewish muslim christian and then you have like the conclusion as one room, so you can you can go from for four rooms one after the other, um, and play fifteen minutes each, or you can do just um, an hour long from start to end, or you have the abbreviated version, which takes you instead of uh, to seven different sites, just to four different sites, and that is the shorter version, which is twenty five minutes long. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks. They, they all they all work off of uh, like the the navigation system essentially is uh, in the Tower of David. We found a, like an ancient, well not ancient. I think it was you were saying it was eighteen uh, hundreds uh, Nimrod uh, that someone had built a map of Jerusalem, and we were able to do a photogrammetric scan of that. And that essentially is kind of like the game board. So all the places and locations that you're going to sort of appear uh, out of that, and that you sort of have the ability uh, in the experience to sort of have it, it's uh, that you can you can experience uh, you can kind of you can go back and look at things you can uh, you, you sort of have the agency of where you go in that world essentially and then it teleports you to the various locations which are uh, photogrammetrically captured scans of those locations. Well uh, thank you uh, Nimrod and Sean for sharing this project. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, decision makers we'll see you back after the next presentation. Uh, up next, we have Kusunda, Gayatri, and Felix. Turn your cameras on. Join us. Hey, Hi. nice to see you. So nice to see you, oh, Google. Through the screen. <laughs> uh, all right, are you ready? Yes, just a sec. Uh, just a second. Yes. Do you see right. our screen? I see your screen. It looks good. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Go ahead and take us on an adventure. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Renee and VIFF for having us here. Felix and I are really excited to present uh, Kusunda Speak to Awaken. Yeah, so Kusunda is a VR experience uh, that explores what makes a language fall asleep and what does it take to wake one up. And uh, now we're gonna show you the trailer. 
গিলাঙ্গি মাট ওই চি আগ পে টক ডা গিলাং মাজে মা খানি বসনি আপনার ছাপর ভেতরে বসনি আমার দুলা মা বসনি বাঘ ভালো ছিল লড়নি খানি তিনি কুরু হুন্ছ আর বেশিকে ভাষা আমার কষ্ট লাগে ননম্র লাগছ আপনার ভাষা বাইরে বলল পাইছি তারপরে একদম তন্ন শুনে কুরু হুন্ত এ কুসুন্ডা ভাষা রয়েন ভনে কিন নেপাল কুসুন্ডা ছ ভনে পনে অস্তিত্ব রহদেই ন यो कुसुंडा भाषा संस्कृति एकदम बचा सकु भाई मैं एकदम आश है या सो वाई इज दिस रेलिवेंट एंड अर्जेंट इज दज बिकज कुसुंडा इज नट द ओनली लैंग्वेज दैट्स ऑन इज जर्नी टू रेक्लमेशन और रिवाइटलाइजेशन Every two weeks, a language falls silent, and um, that's what makes Kusunda um, timely and relevant. Yeah. So since neither Gayatri nor me are Kusunda, co-creation is really at the core of this uh, project. We work very closely with our protagonists, Little Bardur and uh, Hema, but of course also with the rest of the Kusunda community. Uh, the Kusunda call themselves call themselves the kings of the forest, and that's because uh, not very long ago they lived a traditional hunter gatherer life in the jungles of Western Nepal. And um, Kusunda, the VR experience, is a uh, an intergenerational story where 86 year old um, Kusunda shaman. Lil Bahadur talks about the past of the Kusunda community, whereas his granddaughter, 16 year old Hema. Uh, represents what you may call a modern Kusunda identity, and what brings them together is really the the love for their mother tongue and their culture. Yeah, so visually we have uh, kind of two approaches. On the one hand, we use volumetric video and photogrammetry for the now, for the current time. So we scanned their house and um, um, we have filmed them volumetrically. And for the past, we are using hand painted three D animations that are based on um, motion capture data. Um, and since um, Kusunda, like so many other indigenous languages, has, has an oral tradition, um, we work with voice-based interactions. So we invite the users to speak certain words and phrases in Kusunda in order to access different story worlds and interact within the experience. Um, as we mentioned, um, this is a global phenomenon and Kusunda is part of a virtual reality series. Um, episode one is going to be uh, diving into Seraya, which is um, produced by Poki Poki Creative and um, looks at the, the Seraya community, the Seraya Aboriginal community in Taiwan who have successfully um, uh, revitalized or reclaimed their language. So that's a production that's done together with the Seraya community. Yeah, so we plan to distribute this in film festivals, museums, uh, community events, of course, especially in Nepal. But uh, given the current situation, we also really plan for a strong online distribution. And we would love to keep up our track record or success with the impact uh, that we had with one of our previous projects, Home After War, uh, which ran at multiple um, A-list film festivals um, around the world and won some awards. But most importantly for us was that we were able to meet a high level impact audience at um, venues such as the United Nations headquarters in New York. And we are not fully finished. We are racing to finish the piece and um, looking for distribution and impact partners. We hope to be done at the end of this year. And um, yeah, just got done with the Sundance New Frontier Story Lab and um, feeling quite confident about um, how, we, how it's taking shape. Yeah, we are almost done with our present presentation. We just have one last ask because we are training a neural network in order to do the voice-based interaction. And for that, uh, as you might know, uh, they are data hungry. And since there's not many, there are not many speakers of Kusunda, we ask people to lend uh, us their voice. So if you could um, also lend us your voice on the speak to awaken.nowhearmedia.net, you, um, yeah. You can help the project by donating your voice. Thank you so much.
Wonderful. And uh, I've done the, uh, I, I have donated my voice. I have uh, no voice anymore. It is now theirs. It's quite <laughs> fun. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to do it. Uh, wonderful project. Thank you for the update. I've uh, loved this project from its early inception and I'm so thrilled to see it take shape. Uh, decision makers, uh, things that you want more information about, things that weren't clear, feedback. Yes, I have a question. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I'm really excited by these uh, first images and I uh, can't wait to see the, the experience soon. Uh, I have a question. I'm sure here in France, many people want to see it. And if I see in the trailer, it's uh, you're using subtitles. How is conducted the experience? Is through a voiceover or subtitles? Because if I understand the the characters in the story are speaking Kasunta language, so how do you drive the story? That's a great question. Actually, the, the, um, our co-creators, uh, Lil Bahadur and Hema, both of them are speaking Nepali in the piece because that is the language that they speak and are most comfortable speaking. Um, and we are in the original Nepali version of the piece, which will be in Nepal. Um, there's no voiceover, but for every other version, language version, we are doing a, a voiceover. There's just one part that's actually in Kusunda, but that and it's not translated. Actually, that's yeah, that's not <laughs> going to be translated because if you don't speak Kusunda, it's just you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, could you talk to us a little bit more about the two different episodes and where you're at in terms of uh, of the, the two of them and, and how you plan on distributing them, whether separate together or, or what that looks like? Hi, Blake. Um, yeah, uh, so um, actually the partnership with Pokey Pokey Creative happened quite organically. We uh, we came together knowing and finding out that we were both working on a similar theme and it made sense to collaborate. So we applied for a co-production funding in Taiwan and got it successfully. So that was great. And they are actually showing, releasing the piece. Their premiere is at the Kaohsiung International Film Festival. And we will be releasing a work in progress at the Kaohsiung uh, International Film Festival in October. And both, both projects can work together or um, yeah, ind individually. Great, thank you very much. I have a We've got time question. for uh, one or two other questions. Do you mind if I dive in with one? Um, so first of all, uh, I'm at the, the company called Scatter. And Hi, and thanks a lot for kit. all Hi. your help. <laughs> You're so welcome. So I, um, my team, or specifically our product and support teams, adore your project and really speak highly of your work. Um, and it's totally evident in the project. My question is um, co-creation as a, as a methodology means many things to many people. And it's also, it's always, uh, it's, it can be life-changing, it can be complex. Um, and ideally, it's actually significantly changes the project itself. So I would ask in this case, like, what is, is there one thing that without the pointed or specific contribution of your co-creators um, in this in this Kusinda community, is there one thing that just wouldn't be the way it is now in the project, if not for that contribution? So I think one thing that actually came from them was voice-based interaction. So I think the, the, the idea of like speaking the language also as a form of solidarity, I think that was something that resonated with a lot of them and was really important for them. For us, it, like there were moments in between where we thought, oh God, this is so difficult. <laughs> like, how will we ever make it work? So, so I think that's one. And, uh, but uh, to be very honest, the co-creation part has been very, very, very challenging, especially now because the, the internet in Nepal is, is really bad in the, in the valley where, where they live. And so it was uh, very challenging to now stay in touch and uh, yeah. So challenging that we, in the end, started writing letters to each other because <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't have video calls or anything. So we started sending um, letters written down. So <laughs> can I just hop in with one quick one? Yeah, I was I about to say we have time for one more, Tom. So why don't you uh, make All it right. a good one? Hello. Uh, Hi. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering. It kind of follows on from that one, but in terms of like public exhibition and things. Uh, I thought that the training the AI was actually like super interesting and could be super interesting to a public audience. What's what's like a call to action that a public audience could 
take up once they've seen it or during the piece? Yeah, that's a that's a really good and a hard question, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think it's. I mean, uh, whoever we we speak. So um, I speak um, my mother tongue. Uh, is Tamil and I don't speak it in my everyday life and I really do miss speaking it so much so that I just speak to the walls at some times you know um, and I think that is something really um, important about language and identity that if you if you if we can get that across that there is something really integral about um, something that's hidden within a language that's a worldview um, and if we can get people to understand that and respect that, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, and we'll, yeah. And, and I think an, another small ask would be also to really encourage Hema in, in her effort to, um, to revitalize this language, to yeah, pick that up as a, as a 15 year old is, 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 is quite a, yeah, a big task. Wonderful. Well, Felix and Gathri, so good to see you both. Such an amazing project. Uh, uh, I, I know it's going to do really well when it is released into the wild. No We're going to move on now to our next project, uh, Trauma Drama. Scott, do we got you there? Right. Oh, Scott. Hello. Yep. Hi. Nice to Where meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Finally. Yeah, I'm very excited to hear your project. Uh, we, I, one of the things I love about doing these events is that we always discover some new work that we didn't know about before. And this was one of those projects. I was unfamiliar with you and your work, and, and now uh, I've uh, taken upon myself to educate myself, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite a fan. Yes. Well, we are happy to, happy to be here. This is actually the world premiere for this project this, uh, at VIF. So, um, so yeah, we are very, very happy to be a part of it. So uh, I should Wonderful. share my screen, I guess. All right. <clears throat> okay. Take it away, Scott. Oops. Okay. So, um, so my name is Scott Lynch, and I am here to present Trauma Drama. It is a six DOF volumetric music video by the artist NPO. Uh, Trauma Drama is a project that talks a lot about mental health um, and really kind of explores the artist's frame of mind as they were writing the song. We also filmed it within the landscape of Chicago, which is where the artist grew up. Um, oops. Okay, sorry. There we go. Um, so uh, Day uh, is a recent graduate of the University of Illinois where they studied music technology. Um, Day was the director of the project and also is the artist and performer. So, she, uh, so they were really the, the main creative force behind the project. I uh, run a a small uh, XR production studio in Chicago called Voyeur. And so I, I came onto the project as a producer, supervised the volumetric capture of the, of the film, and then um, headed up post-production. So I'm just gonna play a short trailer so you can hear the music and also see what the project looks like from the, art, uh, from the viewer's point of view. I just hope that we don't fall through. Chama drama, chama drama, chama drama, hey. Chama jama, chama jama, chama jama, ayy You got your issues cause we all do I just hope that we don't fall through So as you can see in that trailer, um, we really tried to um, show the, the landscape of Chicago and find really interesting places um, that kind of underscore uh, what's happening in the song. Uh, we used uh, a full 360 volumetric technique. Um, so when the viewer is inside that experience, they can, they can really explore sort of the displacement um, of, the, of the point cloud and really just see the, the, the performance of NPO from really any kind of uh, perspective. Um, the, uh, one of the other really cool and key parts of this project were our dancers and choreographers, Jay Haley and Aaron Smiley. 
who are both Chicago-based um, artists. Um, they worked with us to develop and create a, uh, these ghost characters that, that sort of haunt our protagonist in a, in a few of the different scenes. So we were able to work out some and play with some, some interesting techniques to kind of create these ethereal spiky uh, forms that, that kind of dance throughout the scenes. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we try to really just pay attention to is sort of just the, the aesthetics of volumetric and, and sort of how, you know, the, the artifacts that you get from, from this technique and really explore like the the depth and um, and and so we 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 think that it really helps underscore the messages inside the song and then um, also just creates a really uh, unique point of view uh, and experience for the viewer to to kind of see a performance that in in a way that they have probably not ever seen before. Um, the video is. Uh, the, the, our preferred format for, for viewing it is, is a kind of a newer format called sixed off video. Um, and that is a, uh, it's a video format where there's RGB data on the top and, and depth data on the bottom. And then um, if you play it in, inside of a player such as the pseudoscience player, which is a, um, a free player online, um, you, you kind of get an extrapolated point cloud. Um, um, and so we are also providing it in a stereoscopic 360 format. If, if people are, if uh, there are platforms that are interested in, 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 uh, uh, in hosting it, um, just to kind of get it more accessible to more people. Um, but yeah, we're really looking to work with partners or distribution platforms that are interested in developing their six off video capabilities. And um, we would love to partner with them to, you know, Get this music out to a, and then and this and this content out to a wider audience. Um, for more information, you can reach me at scottvoyer.com. And um, if you uh, want to follow NPO, you can you can search for them on YouTube and Spotify and socials, and um, they would uh, I'm sure appreciate your support. So that is my presentation. So, Great, thank you so much, Scott. Stop sharing. Great work. Uh, really, really dig the project. All right, decision makers, hop in, ask questions. I'd love to know, um, and just because I'm uh, new to it, um, a little bit more about um, existing sixed off video players, um, and uh, if, to your knowledge, there are any like existing WebXR ones, and you know, sort of how you're tackling, um, how you're thinking about. Uh, getting volumetric, you know, getting the volumetric version to everyone who experiences um, uh, their, their music in some of the ways you're talking about. Yeah, well, um, so right now there is a, um, there is a free player called the Pseudoscience Sixth Off Player, which is made by a developer um, out of, he's based out of LA. But um, so that, that was kind of how we've been showing it to people is sort of sideloading it and, and, um, uh, and, you know, kind of presenting it that way. We would love to work with somebody who is a little bit more on the development side, who can help us build a Unity shader um, to display this. That's, that's, we were, we've been experimenting with trying to get it there, but we just are limited on some of our, we're kind of like lit, hitting a ceiling on our own abilities to get it working properly. Um, so, we, so we're definitely looking for partners who have maybe a little bit more experience in that area. Um, but we think because it's, because it is a video format, it, I guess in theory is something that could be built into uh, like existing video platforms, like other, other, um, you know, there's like you know places like Veer, Veer or other things. Like, I, I would think in theory they could expand their platform to also support this this volumetric format. So, so we're hoping to kind of help give them some material to to develop it with. Yeah. Rad. Uh, plenty of time for other questions from anyone else uh, about uh, the, the work that Scott's plans for getting out into the world. I have a just a quick question kind of about the, the origins of the project and mm -hmm. kind of exhibition prospects. Yeah. Um, what, so what was the, what was the reasoning to present this in VR as opposed to kind of, you know, traditional 2D music video that obviously gets a little bit more of a yeah. of a quick distribution. So this this was like a really interesting project. It actually um, came out of a program 
that's based here in Chicago called the Everyone Can Code Chicago program, which is a um, it's a public private partnership between Apple, the city of Chicago and JP Morgan. And what they do is they help uh, place promising and um, talented Chicago based students at startups and tech companies within Chicago as in, as paid interns to um, to kind of learn about careers. And so uh, during this we were involved with that program. And, and so one of the things that I was just really interested in personally was just exploring volumetric video as, as, a, um, as, a, as a medium. And so Day, Day was one of the students that was recommended to like work with us. And um, you know, with their background in music and with like their interests, it sort of came, we kind of just came up with this, this idea of like, okay, well let's, we have to make something that's tech. We, we're all kind of interested in this, this medium as, as, a, as an artistic form. Let's make a music video for you and explore what being creative in this space it, like might be like. So that was kind of that's kind of how it was started. Um, uh, you know, obviously we we knew we know that six off is going to be kind of limited. So we also ma mastered it as the as the stereoscopic three hundred and sixty, which is a little bit more widespread um, uh, of, of a format. Yeah, thank you. I, I think. Just, just to say, I, I, I love hearing the, the actual origins and kind of the relationship between you and Day. I would absolutely suggest, like, if you do pitch, a, pitch this project again, be sure to share that, because I think that that's really important to know the context of the, the piece. Um, it looks great, though. It looks really okay. interesting. Yeah, th thanks for that feedback. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely make sure we, I actually had that slide in there and I, I took it out because I was like, I need to, I, I might, I'm like a little lo long on time. But yeah, I'll put it back in. No doubt. Cool. We've got time for one more quick question, if anyone has it. With your experience, this experience working with the six dot video, um, how do you plan on utilizing that for, for the future? Do you plan on working more of it? Has it been a positive experience working in, with six dot video? I think uh, for me, I think like aesthetically, it has like a really interesting look, um, which I think is, is, is valuable for certain types of stories. Um, I'm definitely interested in mixing sort of 360 video and game engines in some sort of, in some, in, in, in a certain type of way, like moving forward. Um, I don't know if our technique was something that works for every project. Um, you know, it, it, it does have a very specific kind of rough feel to it, um, which I thought worked really well aesthetically for this project, but I think we are interested in, in volumetric video, but I think it's sort of, again, it's just gonna be like a sort of a, a project by project basis. Is that the right form uh, that we want to express ourselves with? Dig it. Well, Scott, a pleasure. Thank you yeah, so much for you. sharing your project. Yeah. And next up, we have Dust. Uh, Andre and Maria, would you mind joining the line? Hello, Andre. Hello, Renee. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to EIFF. Absolutely. Thank you for staying up late and uh, sharing your work. Uh, is Maria also joining or are you presenting uh, alone? I'm presenting alone on, okay. also on her behalf. Fantastic. Go ahead and share your screen and uh, we'll get started. So, uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Andrei Boleslavsky. And together with uh, Maria Yudova, um, we created a project that is uh, titled Dust. Dust is a volumetric uh, recording of contemporary dance. It's a, it's a recording from uh, all three sides. And uh, the, the experience of a, of a user is that um, when, you, when you enter the, the VR, you first see the 3D scan of, of space. We usually make the experience uh, site-specific. We feature the local environment to create smoother onboarding in, into the experience. And uh, the does, does have elements of mixed reality. That means you, you get to see not just the volumetric recording, but also your body in, in real time. Uh, which creates even more plausible uh, feeling. And uh, 
we really loved that uh, when when we had the first presentations of, of the dust, people were really uh, doubting what is real and what is not. It's it's uh, blending the the VR and uh, real experience in, in, into one. We really really like this uh, confusion. And the, the experience features uh, two dancers, uh, Roman and uh, Maria, and the, the the topic of dust is is very relevant to to piece that we uh, seen today as well. Um, we we chose the topic of dust because it's it's something that uh, most of the religions uh, work with and. Uh, they, they say that uh, uh, everything was made from dust and we will become dust again. And also, also in, in science, the dust is somehow what uh, formed all of our bodies and we will become that dust again. So the, the project does have this uh, both religion, religious and scientific uh, connotations. We created the dust um, as an inspiration that, um, thanks to the inspiration that we got during the residency at the dance company Rumber, when we started to work a lot with volumetric recordings. And we were absolutely struck by the, by the fact that it was the first time that the recorded media gave us the same feeling as uh, as when you see real performance, you, you really get to see the, the person in wide scale in 3D. You can you can walk around and um, during really during the first trials, people most of the time they try to touch the dancer and to they try to find out what is real and what what is not. We created the recording uh, here in Prague when we are where we are based. Uh, we had a studio and we captured the uh, performance of the dancers from the three points of view. So, so it's not just a volumetric recording where you get to see the 3D shape from one point of view, but it's, it's uh, merged into a 360 shell. So you can walk around in the performance and see it from many different sides. That also influenced the creation process because the choreography had to be changed a lot because of the fact that the audience is basically sharing the, the space with the dancers. You are not sitting far away in the audience. So the, the performance is actually much more than gentle than what would be uh, normally made for, for stage. And also the frontality of the choreography changed a lot. because We, we don't really know where the audience is uh, looking from. So this is the uh, resulting uh, volumetric capture, uh, 360 view. And we use uh, post-processing effects uh, on um, made with, with shaders to dissolve the bodies. We, we made the dust to be an experience for galleries and for the festivals. It is uh, not meant to be seen online, both, both for artistic and uh, technical reasons. Um, we had the chance to tour the experience in really beautiful and generous spaces. I think our most favorite space is this uh, Jewish synagogue in in, uh, in Slovakia. So that also really blended well with the with the topic of the work. Uh, we were very happy to receive uh, many awards, including the Japanese Media Art Festival Award, and we went to more than twenty venues to showcase the work and. I think that that was a very important experience for us to meet the audience and to change the work in, in the process based on uh, what we could see. The project also does have an interactive uh, version of the site. It features a web VR version that is very uh, simplified, but it gets you a smaller taste of what, what the final experience is about. So th thanks a lot for um, your attention and for inviting me again. And if you have a further question and uh, if you are interested in the project, please uh, go ahead and uh, visit the website.
Wonderful. Thank you, Andre. Decision makers, hop back in. Uh, and I'd be happy to kick things off with a question around what you uh, hope to do with the project next, since it already has uh, more than a lot of the other projects, you know, uh, reached an audience. Uh, what, what, what is next uh, in terms of distributing or trying to find a wider audience than you already have? Well, we, we, we follow the usual way how to, how to tour the project. So we, we sign it up for the festivals. Often we get invited. It will be showed uh, next in, in Bologna, in Italy. But obviously during the corona crisis, uh, those kind of events are in uh, risk of being cancelled. And also the, there, are, there are many safety concerns, uh, some safety concerns in many countries when using the VR headset. So um, at, at the moment, so at the moment we are working on upcoming VR projects and we still continue to work with the VR experiences that are inspired by contemporary dance. Wonderful. Any uh, thoughts or feedback for Andre? Uh, yeah. Hi, Andre. <laughs> it's nice Hi. to see you. <laughs> um, I just wondered about the role of the participant during the piece and also a follow on from that is whether there's a multiplayer aspect to it. Uh, that's, that's a really good question. <laughs> yes and no. So the experience is a cinematic experience. The, that means you don't influence anything. You don't get to really interact. Although many people, they, they somehow have, have this synesthesia that they somehow feel how they touch the dancer because they, they see their own hands uh, rendered in the same quality as the, as the dancer in the, with the same technology. And uh, in many cases, they, they start to interact with each other because you also get to see the other visitors in the gallery. And usually kids, they start to hunt each other and they play, play this hide and seek. So we actually created a new VR project that was based on this experience of people interacting within each other in, in, in dust. The, the new project is called Camouflage, which looks a lot different. Oh, I love that chaos. <laughs> we have time for a short question, Paul. So in fact, it's like a show also for the people outside of the headset, but would it be possible to have like several people in the headset in the same time to have like maybe two, three, four, five, ten headsets? Really, really good question. So far, we tried uh, only two at once. Um, we did synchronize the timelines. So the, the technical issue is that the real-time camera Kinect that we use can be only used by one computer. But we, we, we managed to get two of them running, and we, we had it uh, twice. Um, it, it gets a bit more tricky because you the, the, the space is rather intimate. So I think with five people, it wouldn't work that well. But let's say two, three would, would be really nice. We, we tried two and it was, it was amazing. And is it like a, a concept that you want to extend or to, to use for another show or, or concept like a, a bigger concept or something else in the future? At, at the moment, um... At the moment, we are focusing more on, on things that could be distributed online because it, it is actually very limited to create work that, that is just for, for venues and that always requires our setup procedure. Um, yeah. Thank okay. you, decision makers. Great questions. Thank you for making a really rad project and for being a part of this, Andre. Next up, we that. have Image Technology Echoes. Lauren, are you there? Hi, Lauren. Hello. Can you hear me? You. Uh, I'm really excited about this project. Another one that wasn't on my radar before we reviewed all the projects. Such a cool project. Uh, would you mind sharing your screen? Yes. All right, whenever you're ready, Lauren. Okay, so thank you very much, Renee and uh, Anna and everybody who put this together. I'm really excited about having this opportunity to tell everybody about this work. 
Um, so Image Technology Echoes is actually, we're doing the final touches on it right now and it hasn't actually been shown yet. There are some events lined up at the beginning of next year and we're kind of working towards having things finalized for then. Um, it's an immersive narrative. Uh, Lauren, would you mind narrative. making it big and pretty? Oh, sorry. No worries. <laughs> Apologies. That's um, nice and big and pretty. Right. So um, with this work, I was interested in, um, in inner, inner life and what's revealed on the surface. So how different our inner lives look to what we reveal on the surface or what, to, what other people perhaps perceive in us. In the experience, you enter into a sort of a large museum space. You're in a smaller gallery within a larger museum space and there are two people, an older man and a younger woman, who are having a conversation in front of a painting of a stormy ocean. Um, and the conversation will just sort of loop. It goes for around two and a half minutes um, if the player doesn't do anything, but if, or, or the visitor, but if uh, you go close to one of these characters or actually step inside their bodies, you're teleported into the inner space of that character, which in both cases, it's, a, it's an actual room. Uh, with with objects and and texts and images inside, and in the window through the windows of the room, you can see the scene in the gallery through the subjective subjective vision of that character. And in each case, the painting looks very different from what you just saw in the gallery. Um, so this is just to show the the man's in, inner space from a different perspective. You see these images that are on the walls and the objects on the tables and there are, there are texts around that you can kind of read and that reveal different layers of the narrative. And they're always moving and changing depending on uh, the gaze of the, of the visitor. So each, you know, the, you could play it a few different times and you would have a different experience each time and maybe find, find something new each time. Uh, there's also a moment inside the gallery that's sort of an Easter egg. It's um, if you look at something in the in the gallery for a for a certain amount of time, then it will kind of launch this event where both of the characters freeze and their faces open up, and you can actually see the in a in a space and the little homunculus version of the of the character inside. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, the kind of the way that the way that I built this work. So especially in the inner space of the woman, there are a lot of uh, digitized artworks, so drawings and photographs and little sculptures and texts around that are actually things that I've created over the last period of the last 15 years or so. And I sort of took took some of these some of these objects and decided to kind of integrate them into this narrative to kind of because there is a slightly autobiographical layer to to this work that that, that sort of it can also be found there um, and so this actually um, kind of brings me to how I would ideally like to show this work so it's an installation uh, that's it, it, it can't really be shown online as it is at the moment. Um, so it's kind of more something for perhaps for festivals or for museum or gallery scenarios. Um, so this is an example of one of the digitized works. It's um, a series of 100 uh, miniatures that I painted on slide cases. And so the images in the man's room, for instance, like these, these images are sort of occupying the photo, photo frames and canvases on the walls and, and these types of spaces. And so I would really like to use uh, things like this in the installation and kind of create this, these echoes that you also find in the title in the installation as well, where you're kind of experiencing things in color in, in the physical world, whereas in the virtual one, you see them in black and white, or you might experience something at a very different scale. So this, this work is, we're very lucky. To, we just found out recently that the work was nominated for the VR Art Prize. So it will be um, shown with the other nominees early next year in Berlin. And this is, the, this is the installation that I pitched for them. So obviously this can be scaled up and down for each different uh, scenario. But in this case, I included the slide, the slide miniatures. Um, this is a kind of sort of walkthrough where the Kind of visitor might be might be able to stop outside while somebody else is using the VR headset and watch the slideshow, and then later on possibly inside uh, I would I would like to include a selection of of some of these digitized works, but the ones that are very 
different in scale to the ones that are to, to the way that they appear in the VR. So for instance, this is the size of the real painting that was used for the, the kind of stormy sea in the gallery, which appears much smaller, well, it appears much bigger in the VR than it does in, in real life. And so I think that that brings me more or less to the end of what I plan to say. Um, I'd be very interested to hear anybody's questions and thanks very much again for having me here. Thank you for sharing your project, Lauren. Decision makers, come back in. Such a rad project. I, uh, I loved uh, experiencing it, really cool. It's really beautiful. Uh, just a simple question. Is there like any dialogues or it's like a, a non-dialogues experience? Yeah, so there's a, there's a conversation in the gallery that's kind of like a quite a kind of slow, a little bit kind of awkward conversation between these two people. Uh, and in the interior um, spaces, each of the characters is sort of um, speaking at, at like sort of saying a monologue that they appear to be reacting to what's happening outside. So at some points they might seem a little bit upset or a little bit nervous, but um, what they're actually saying, um, I kind of used a deep writing framework to, to write what they're saying. It's actually quite cryptic sort of, um, you know, almost like cut up poetry. Um, and it's mostly in their gestures and in their expressions that you get any sort of meaning from them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have um I have one of those questions that's not a question. Um, it, it is to say, uh, it's really rare, especially in disciplines like this, where um, typically VR requires large teams, and oftentimes in large teams you really have to do compromise. And so oftentimes it's mm -hmm. rare that you actually get really work that's evidently feels like a like a really distinct artistic outcome, or kind of an auteur type project. And I really immediately got that from this project and I was really struck by it. And so that was the first thing I just want to say. I was like, it's, it's incredibly evident. And also I know that it takes an immense amount of effort to work in that particular way because it's, it's consuming, it's all consuming. Um, so that's my non-question. I followed by the actual question, which is um, the thing I was left curious about was actually the, I'm, I'm hearing that there are these many personal threads and layers and themes and in that framework, who are these people? Are they actually specific people that, are, that you know? Are they sort of written characters? And is there sort of a real relationship between the two of them? Well, part of the way that I wanted to kind of structure it was that it's kind of like a story that's a spiral, that you have to kind of keep on going around between these three spaces to finally, if you're really interested in finding out who they are, to then there is actually there there is actually a, a set of clues that will tell you what what's going on and why this conversation is the way that it is and um, and and why these inner spaces look the way that they do. With the people that I've tested it with so far, a lot of people just like kind of playing it, you know, and they don't um, they sort of just just find the atmosphere very interesting and they don't. I tend to sort of stop at some point on the spiral, but you could kind of keep on going. And I wanted to kind of create something that somebody could spend two minutes with or half an hour with, and that they would kind of come away with, you know, one wouldn't have a superior experience to the other, you know. Challenge accepted. Thank you very time. much. Thank you. I'd actually like to stay on that, that same subject and talk a little bit about if you could talk a little bit more about the linear or non-linear uh, aspects of, of the project, when you're thinking about um, the exhibition uh, in terms of, you know, uh, in a gallery context, I can see that working really well to allow people to, to engage with it um, in different ways, in different amounts of time, et cetera. In, in festivals, um, often we're, we're very much about regimented throughput. And I was just wondering, particularly because um, in your presentation, you had that one moment where, which you called an Easter egg, which to me just, it feels like it could be such an amazing climactic moment in a linear narrative um, mm -hmm. to, to have this reveal where we've already seen their interior, you know, uh, spaces, but to see their faces open up and something that kind of graphically, um, striking. So I was just wondering if you've given any thought to uh, to having either multiple 
versions of this or if or just what your thoughts are around around kind of those two different forms of exhibition um well yeah this is a good question i think something that i'm looking into with all of my works the ones that are in development and some of the older works as well is sort of creating camera systems that can make kind of video video work so that people can actually experience it as a video this is also something that's a little bit more covid friendly um, and that also maybe in a festival situation would take a little bit of the pressure off because then people would be able to go and watch on, on the screen if they felt that the nine minutes or whatever I, whatever I had stipulated as the kind of duration of the experience or the, the recommended sort of media, like the um, average amount of time that I would assume that people would spend in there. Um, that they would be able to kind of spend time watching it from a from a different angle. So I would like to kind of make wandering cameras that would accidentally find this Easter egg moment or that would sort of go in and sort of circle around the room and um, make it into a, something a little bit more like more cinematic, I suppose, but in a in a kind of um, generative way, I guess. Yeah. Oh, thanks. It's really beautiful. It looks amazing. Thank you, decision makers, and thank you, Lauren, uh, for making such a beautiful project and sharing it with us. We'll all be watching closely as uh, you release this into the wild. Uh, thank you. Next up, we have Lessons of Auschwitz. Uh, Dennis, are you uh, with us? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Dennis. Good to see you. Yeah. Hi, Renee. <laughs> hi, everyone. Would you nice mind you. Uh, sharing your screen? Yeah, sure. Brilliant. Well, we're ready whenever you are, Dennis. Okay, yeah, I'm ready too. So, um, hello, my name is Dennis. Uh, I'm a director and producer of uh, volumetric short film, Lessons of Auschwitz. This film was created by RT, International News Channel, and Studio Fugitalism uh, for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz concentration camp. Uh, today we live in a digital era and new times ask for new tools uh, of expressions and new language to engage uh, younger audience um, uh, in meaningful stories. Uh, today, 75 years later, since the end of the World War II, we're redistributing headlines uh, such as these ones you see on the screen. And unfortunately, a number of studies uh, find a lack of basic knowledge uh, about the Holocaust about, um, among millennials today. Uh, the commemorative link between generations is dimming. So today, in a mostly digital world, uh, we thought it is important to restore the gap and keep younger generations interested in learning history by creating a digital commemoration tribute to the victims of the Holocaust. And here's how it looks like. Oh, sorry. Okay. So to mark the 75th anniversary of liberation, we brought uh, nine teenage students from a Moscow high school to the memorial in Poland uh, to personally undergo the experience. After the trip, they asked, uh, we asked them to express their reactions in VR, where I, being a virtual uh, artist myself, uh, taught them how to express themselves, so how to use uh, tilt brush. And um, Lessons of Auschwitz is a social experiment that aims to show how history can be retold and reimagined by younger generations through digital art. Using uh, Innovation XR film technology, we aim to create a new kind of uh, tribute which will uh, engage and touch younger 
uh, viewers and inspire them to learn more about the Holocaust and more about the production here, uh, how we shoot it. Um, a comprehensive multi-stage six month production lies behind the uh, creation of this uh, project. Uh, we decided to teach nine uh, school students who would eventually go to Poland and become prime creators of the tribute, some historical background. Thanks to Moscow Jewish Mosque, uh, Museum and Tolerance Center, the uh, students learned about the Holocaust during a private tour. And here, here is the making of the project. And uh, about the music, we also teamed up with the composer Per Termin. Uh, who plays the world's oldest electronic instrument patient by his great-grandfather Leon Teremin, which is played and controlled uh, without any physical contact uh, with the performer. Peter composed an original score for the film, a striking tune which sonorous vibrations uh, of the Teremin create a, um, we think, a weeping effect. And... Um, the students used uh, audio-reactive tilt brush, uh, brushes to draw their 3D images, and this allowing visuals to interact with the uh, sound waves. And um, um, the innovative approach paid uh, up with the project getting over 150,000 views and 10 million impressions on social media and online platforms in the first week after the premiere in January this year. And Lessons of Auschwitz was welcomed with positive reviews um, and was already recognized uh, at a number of festivals, including Webby, uh, Shorty, Red Dot Design, VR Awards, Cresta Awards, and of course now here on Vancouver International Film Festival. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I think that's all with the presentation. Thank you, Dennis. All right, decision makers, hop back in. Thoughts, feedback, questions. I'm I'm super intrigued by um, particularly like the experience of the um, uh, kids who helped create the project um, with you, um, and I was wondering if there were plans with this work or sort of the future work to bring um, you know that experience, that possibly you know sort of like the ability to. Um, create in response to history um, and giving that to your, you know, your audience members in addition to, you know, the kids you are collaborating with, because that seems um, really exciting to me. Uh, okay, uh, the main purpose of this uh, project was um, education and the social media. So, yeah, uh, I think that um, the kids are not only helped us, they created this uh, project here, really, they are uh, absolutely authors and that that's one of my main things. Uh, when I was teaching them to use tilt brush, I strictly didn't uh, tell them anything about the uh, visual or something um, something that they created. They have uh, they uh, didn't have any rules or strict uh, plans to do anything. So the main thing why we used VR because it was easier for them to express their feelings to be. Um, at the same time in the same room with their friends, but uh, at the same time, they're uh, strictly in their own uh, work and they feel free, uh, free to express themselves. And uh, um, in the, um, we have uh, two versions of this project. One is the uh, immersive version, uh, the build, where you can, um, uh, it's alone, um, it's a single user experience where you can stand and uh, watch um, nine illustrations um, and uh, hear the music uh, of the termine. So, uh, and uh, see the kids that created this project. And another one, it's a 2D video. So 2D video was made for the social media coverage and uh, uh, why we used um, 
the, one of the reasons why we used the uh, volumetric uh, capture technology because we wanted the kids to share this videos with their friends not only their work but um, people like to look at people so the kids like to share not only uh, what they created in uh, tilt brush especially that they are not uh, professional artists or somehow so um, we wanted them to share themselves I am, this is another one of these projects that I'm, that my team, this, I think it's a huge depth kit on this project as well. And my team is, is a huge fan of this project. Um, and there's a theme that I'm really excited about, which is the use of the theremin, um, which is a, a, a historic and amazing instrument. Uh, and there's this wonderful theme, which is it, it tilt brush is very similar in a way to the theremin. It's a it feels largely like a touchless creation. Um, and then I'm also seeing you're sort of you're using aesthetics that look like the early days of uh, like video synthesizers, like the Rut Etra, for example. And so I'm seeing that there are these parallels, and it leads me to wonder: Is there any degree of kind of audio reactivity? Is there a relationship specifically between that the theremin playing and the visuals that are present on screen? Uh, yeah, it doesn't work uh, exactly now in the interactive version in the build, uh, but we plan to um, do that. It worked uh, in the 2D video. So um, when the kids were working, I asked them to use uh, at least one or two brushes that react on the sound. And when, we're in, when we were planning this project, uh, yeah, I just know personally Piotr. I know he's a great composer and musician, and I thought that um, the the fully digital uh, um, br brushing technique is uh, extremely goes cool with the uh, fully digital uh, music instrument. And uh, we asked Peter to make a tune, and uh, he um, he made it from the first uh, from the first time, and it was ideal. So uh, yes, the idea was to um, mix the graphic uh, with the sound, and it should react on the uh, on the on the sound. So like an equalizer. Oh, Renee, we don't hear you. I was just whispering to myself. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your your project, uh, and thank you, decision makers. We uh, have to move on to the next project now. Coming up. Give me Thank one. Harry, uh, do you want to join us? Hello, everyone. Thanks Hi, Harry. Talking. Hello. I'll uh, just share my screen. <clears throat> All right. And whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Um, so my name is Harry, I'm the producer of Give Me One, a 360 freedom of experience about the ballroom Vogue community, which is due to have its world premiere at BFI London Film Festival as part of LFF Expanded, international premiere at BRE Fest, and German premiere at DOC Leipzig as part of the DOC Newland programme. This project is very much a Bristol story, being a Bristol-based artist myself. Our logline is, meet five members of the UK ballroom scene as they explore their gender and sexuality through volumetric dance and free sexy portraits. I began this, this project in my MA in VR at the University of the West of England under Verity McIntosh and Julia Scott Stevenson and wanted to make an experience that integrated my own queer identity into new ways of storytelling. I gained, um, I, uh, this project was made with, with the support of Arts Council England and um, UE, Bristol VR Lab, the others, Liminar Immersive, and of course the Bristol Ballroom community. Through a series of interviews, it became clear that the project was about safe space and the empowerment and empowerment as the Black Lives Matter campaign became more important than ever. It actually became an all Black Lives Matter film, which is the LGBTQ plus Black Lives Matter movement. I was also there when the statue of Lord Colston in Bristol was toppled. Um, this happened when we we're in post-production and felt strongly that our project is important as part of this discourse. The intention of the project is to show, show new communities how technology or VR can be used to tell stories in different and empowering ways. Um, we see this project as an educational tool 
to show users the importance of the ballroom space to the community. And we hope that this will aid the preservation of these spaces. As part of my MA, I also wrote a paper on the use of volumetric capture and um, mechanical re reproduction of safe space and how a digital safe space does not have the same aura or the same of the, of the physical space, but gives users who are not necessarily welcome into the space a perspective that will bridge an informational gap between different communities. I have also been researching how to make users feel safe based on limited neuroimmersives research as in the onboarding process being blind and deaf to the physical world, um, the users need to have a sense of security and confidence in their facilitator and the space around them, um, which is particularly true for technologically naive individuals. This is part of our sort of exhibition strategy. Uh, we use the magic of the Connect2 cameras, which seems to have limitless opportunities and we're impressed, but also also limited by the technology. Dream would also be to get into a volumetric capture studio, but of course this is a dream. Um, we also use motion capture suits to rig the artists with avatars and have the movement depicted this way with color grading happening in cinema 4D. Um, it's worth noting that we also um, have been adopting MIT's co-creational methods to try and tell the story by working with the community to give them agency over the way their story is told as there's a history in a boring scene of exploitation from filmmakers. Um, I will also show you a trailer quickly. Uh, let me just get it up. Oops. Sorry, one second. Uh, is up somewhere. Sorry, bear with me, bear with me. <laughs> okay, here we go. So the Borum scene was started with the design and intention of creating safe spaces for not just trans women of colour, but queer people of colour. Sharing, dancing. Dance has always been a part of my life. And where I can express myself. It felt like home. It's a place to be free. Our survival and our existence. I bowed in McDonald's because of homophobia. It's our ballroom. It's our competition. We take it very seriously. And so we're going to be taking, um, so we're going to be touring this across the festival circuit first um, with our world premiere happening at London Film Festival in uh, a week. And um, our dream is to get the project across different ballrooms and voguing scenes and across Europe and even the world, um, but still working out the logistics um, as it's kind of de dependent on the COVID pandemic and how it develops. Um, but this film is also viewable online as, as it is a 360 um, project. And in the meantime, I am developing uh, some research um, as part of my fellowship at Bristol and Bath Creative R&D in a new dance volumetric project. And here's our social media handles. Thank you. Open 20 questions. Thank you, Harry. Great presentation. Great project. Uh, decision makers, please come on back. Who's got questions? Hey, uh, you spoke a little bit about um, creating a safe space in the exhibition format as well. Like, what does that look like? Um, so we kind of um, uh, adopted liminal immersive's research process and kind of um, it's about training the facilitators to try and um, sort of make the user feel confident and having um, a sort of onboarding process that's really informative and make sure that the, the user has a kind of um, well-rounded introduction to the technology. And um, we also um, would like to uh, have a sort of decompression zone afterwards for people to kind of um, sit in and kind of um, sort of talk about the experience or have a kind of like sit down because it can be quite overstimulating for some people who haven't tried the technology before. Um, and ideally, there'd also be like a sort of check in service so that people's belongings can be checked in so that people aren't worried about their belongings. And it's just kind of making the users feel really confident um, as they are blind and deaf 
So um, yeah, we, we kind of have also been de developing a script for the facilitators to use. Great, other questions, other thoughts? Uh, I think you've been shooting in Paris now. I recognize the Gaeta Lyrique in Paris. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so the project is a Bristol project, um, but there is um, the Bristol ballroom scene is very young, and are being led by the London scene, which is also um, comparably young to the Paris and New York scene. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we've been so part of the film is that we do go across ballrooms across across Europe and film in different more established ballrooms and talk about it in comparison to the newly formed scene in the UK and how it's developing with the with the lead from different scenes. Yeah, but I think it's a, it's a great network because I see that the uh, voguing is more and more famous now. It's not only like for the underground culture, but now it's arrived in some venue like the Gaeta Lyrique in Paris, which is also a venue where they exhibits often uh, immersive installation and virtual reality sometimes. So I think it's a good network to also maybe propose uh, the, the installation of the VR experience and try to reach the audience. So, so yeah, it's a good project for that, I think. Yeah, I think um, absolutely. Yeah, we would re really like to go to Paris eventually and sort of be in these large institutions. Um, and it really just develops how COVID does develop and but hopefully by the end of next year there'll be some opportunities there to be back in Paris and be able to show the city yeah. what we made. Hope the same. Nice. Uh, other thoughts, feedback? We did our first VR event at the uh, that venue in Paris. Yes, cool. uh, with uh, new images last week. No? Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, no, 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 last year. 2016 actually. Yeah, it was 2016. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Lauren, did you have anything? Sorry, uh, no, just just uh, I really like the pitch. I'm looking forward to seeing the the piece at um, at BFI next week. Uh, I think you know, obviously, this this subject really lends itself so well to volumetric filmmaking. So I'm excited to see uh, what you what you've done with it. Wonderful. Well, Harry, we thank you so much for sharing your project. I really appreciate it, and uh, I wish you all the luck with the premiere. And I hope that it uh, continues to tour in many other places. Uh, you can also check out the beta at the Museum of Other Realities uh, and many of these projects uh, you can check out at the Museum of Other Realities. So please do visit the museum after, uh, after this uh, presentation. And we are on to the final presentation. Thank you all so much for sticking around. Uh, we've got Blue Planet. Uh, Eric, hello. Thank you for joining hey, us. Hey, how you doing, Renee? I'm doing well. Uh, really, really uh, excited for you to share this project. Uh, it uh, captures uh, an element of volumetric that uh, most folks uh, don't explore, which is uh, landscape and outdoor spaces uh, captured. Uh, uh, so I'll let you fill in uh, the rest of the details, but uh, I, I think it's uh, a really exciting aspect of volumetric that most projects don't explore. Well, good, happy to explore it for you. <laughs> okay, well, good, I go ahead and share screen. Yep. All righty. Okay, well, good, well, thanks Renee. Um, and hello everyone, my name is Eric Hansen. I recently started Blue Planet VR and I'm also a faculty member at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Uh, I run the Cinematic VR and Visual Effects curriculum there. Um, and I'd like to show you this recently completed personal biometric project of mine. I forget if I can get the buttons right. Let's see, here we go. However, I'd like to first take you through some influences that led me to this unique piece of work. Um, landscape has always been a central source of mystery and fascination for me throughout my life, beginning with a risky 5,000 foot high hang gliding flight at the ripe age of 16 that altered me forever and set my future path in finding meaning in the natural world. After an education in design and architecture, my career ended up helping uh, pioneer digital environments and feature film visual effects, where I spent decades designing fictitious digital worlds for several tentpole films here in the LA area. However, 12 years ago, a passionate alcohol-fueled campfire discussion high in the Sierra Mountains shifted my course uh, toward meaningful real-world subjects and away from the Hollywood spectacle that I had grown weary of. 
By first starting a company with a partner and developing visual effects techniques to capture the world spherically at extraordinary gigapixel resolution, we wandered into immersive media, first in full dome, then in early VR, always learning more on how to capture environments at the highest possible level. Along the way, we've had amazing collaborations with artists such as Bjork and Ai Weiwei, assisting their ambitions on full dome and VR projects. Later, creating our own 360 films for Jaunt VR allowed us to utilize all of our skills with an increasing focus on natural history and photogrammetry. But the, my biggest turning point was about six years ago with the release of the HTC Vive, um, where we had what I call a Watson Bell-like moment in our office, uh, re-inhabiting an Egyptian tomb in real time that we had captured years earlier impacting me so much that I fully pivoted my career to focus only on photogrammetric six degree experiences onward, resulting in this uh, project. So finally, a true sense of being present in remarkable locations could be created and shared with relative ease. And hoping to foster in a viewer as deep a connection as I gain from these locations, six degree VR is an extraordinary magic and I feel something special is created neurologically by basing it on strictly real world photogrammetric subjects. And with the grand conjunction of amazing tech such as UAVs, GPUs, HMDs, amazing new capabilities have allowed fully detailed capture of complex environments, something I could never have imagined uh, only a few years ago. Of course, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here with this crowd. And lastly, three years of ensuing work has produced Blue Planet VR, a curated collection of over 50 remarkable locations. Um, so now I'll play about a minute of cinematics from some of these uh, scenes. Right. So uh, BPVR is now released on most VR portals over the summer, uh, but much remains to be done to extend its marketing and audience reach and to fund and develop additional titles uh, being planned. Um, I do not seek funding per se, but rather seeking great partners and collaborators, one of the great joys of working in this field. So thanks for, uh, for your time, everyone, and hope to see you in BPVR in the museum about an hour from now. Thank you, Eric. Such stunningly beautiful work. Uh, it really is jaw dropping when you see it. Um, questions from the decision makers, jump in. Should I unshare screen or leave it up? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and unshare. Okay, gotcha. It's eric at blueplanetvr.com if anyone's wanting to yeah. email him. Yeah. It looks amazing. Um, I was just kind of wondering, uh, Beyond experiencing the places of, is there any built-in like educational content or narrative content? Yeah, there certainly is. And the uh, although that was a kind of a diametric I tried to reckon with from the beginning, I didn't want it to be kind of a dry 
uh, you know, didactic kind of title. I wanted it to be experiential and personal. So I hope the, the video conveys that a little bit. That, that of course is pre-rendered, but if you, uh, if you visit it in the museum, you'll, you'll see that um, there's an opening slide that kind of gives you a sense of context, what the site is, a little bit about the meaning of it. But um, there are things embedded in all of these sites. And I hope that uh, viewers, in some cases, I point them out. In some cases, I have interactive features uh, that you can grab and scale things, uh, manipulate. Um, but no, it's funny, I, I get some interest from the educational market that said, let's make it more educational. And that's fine. It would be very useful to do that. But for this initial release of these uh, environments, I really wanted to make it kind of a personal uh, experience for the viewer. I'm also exploring Normcore to see if I can bring, you know, other individuals into these scenes. But um, but no, it's it's kind of I mean I think it's kind of an experiment to, again to see if somebody can create a personal bond with a space. Um, and you know, obviously releasing to the gaming crowd is been a bit challenging. I mean, I've gotten a great reception overall, but uh, not everyone, I think, is attuned to these kind of locations. A lot of these are fairly esoteric places. But, uh, but anyway, so I'm kind of looking for the audience to uh, find meaning in them. I'm glad to hear you talk about multiplayer because that was one of my thoughts initially is that whenever I travel, if I experience a place by myself, it's it almost like it doesn't register unless I'm there with somebody else experiencing yep, it. That's true. Uh, so yeah, I highly encourage you to, yeah, to, you know, try to find a way to make, make that work. Cause I think it will make it a, a rich experience uh -huh. that much more yeah, meaningful. Anyone else have thoughts or feedback? Just to add on to that, actually, Renee, it's like um, we program for a couple of science festivals and uh, similar kind of festivals around Europe and, uh, it would be having a multiplayer aspect would add like kind of a really nice dimension where we could send in like tour guides with uh, an audience member to like talk about a space. But is is that something like you'd be open to like sort of taking the the places and then kind of maybe uh, bringing our own spin onto it? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we license work a lot in my company uh, frequently for different things. There's a lot of interest for this from virtual production, obviously, at the moment. But um, the, uh, yeah, and the, I think, yeah, there's, there's clearly uses for it. And I think in some cases more than others, depending what the site is. Um, but one thing I'm looking forward to doing now, I've spent so much time just trying to make a uh, you know, a highly accurate depiction of these scenes. It's really been like, how close to reality can I get it? And that's been my, my quest for the last few years. But uh, I've got all kinds of ideas on how to abstract photogrammetry now and uh, begin to do a bit more abstract work. And that's going to be an awful lot of fun. So I run two classes at, uh, at USC and VR. And one's kind of a master's studio. And with a few students, we've, we've kind of began to investigate that on how interactivity can, uh, or how the, the, uh, the user's presence can affect abstraction within a highly realistic world. So that's uh, another thing. That I think that's kind of my next thing to do also. And I've got a couple other titles that I'm in pre-planning on now that, uh, of course, are all photogrammetry based and you know, I think uh, photogrammetry, again, I'm, I'm more about environments. I'm always an environments artist in, in features, um, more than I am about performance, of course. But, uh, but I think there's so much great creative potential that is just, you know, just beginning, um, just starting. And obviously, all these wonderful projects we're looking at are highly narrative, and they are about, you know, the present, uh, the human form and, you know, human uh, you know, existential issues. But I think, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of things to do with photogrammetry to support those, uh, those efforts too. Wonderful. Well, Eric, thank you so much for sharing your project and decision makers. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I hope we see you in the museum uh, later today or uh, uh, later this week. It's open until October 7th, the exhibition. So download the Museum of Other Realities and visit us there. Uh, again, Thank you, Eric. Thank you to all of the presenting artists. And uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with any of those artists 
and you have any questions, you can uh, reach out to me directly, Renee, R-E-N-E, at kaleidoscope.fund, and I'll, I'll put you in touch. Uh, we'll see you uh, for our last session in a few minutes uh, with uh, some updates from projects that presented last year. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.